عن موضوع جديد لم يسبق له أن تطرق من قبل في مجال علم الآثار وتطور تاريخ الإنسان تؤثر التطورات الحديثة في الذكاء الصناعي والتعلم الآلي على كل قطاع من قطاعات المجتمع بطرق جديدة وغير متوقعة وتمتد من التطبيقات التي نستخدمها يوميا على أجهزتنا المحمولة إلى السيارات التي تقيادة والتشخيص السريري والتطورات العلمية المتقدمة ويبرز الذكاء الصناعي كأداة فاعلة لزيادة القدرات البشرية مع إمكانات هائلة لفائدة البشرية في هذه الندوة سيقدم المحاضرون لمحة عامة عن التأثير المحتمل للذكاء الاصطناعي على الطريقة التي نفهم بها ونفسر بها التاريخ البشري وعلى الطريقة التي نتعامل بها مع تحديات التنمية البشرية كما ستركز الندوة بشكل خاص على الأدوار التي يلعبها الذكاء الاصطناعي والتعلم الآلي في تفسير كميات هائلة من البيانات من مختلف التخصصات في مجال علم الآلي عنوان ندوة الليلة هو استخدام الذكاء الاصطناعي في علم الآثار وتطور تاريخ الإنسان وضيوفنا هم الأستاذ عماد تيناوي المدير التنفيذي في مجموعة إنجيج اي اي وسيتحدث السيد عماد عن تأثير الذكاء الاصطناعي على التطوير والتنمية في خمس عشرة دقيقة السيد ديفيد كلير مدير إدارة البيانات المبتكرة في مجموعة إنجيج اي اي وسيتحدث عن الذكاء الاصطناعي والبيانات في خمس عشرة دقيقة الدكتورة سامية درابو المتخصصة في علم الفيزياء والفلك وعلم البيانات وستتحدث عن الذكاء الاصطناعي وعلم الآثار في خمس عشرة دقيقة بعدها سنفتح المجال للنقاش في مدة خمس عشرة دقيقة قبل أن نبدأ أود أن أتقدم بخالص الشكر وجزيلا للدكتورة صبا فارس على مساندتها في ترتيب هذه الندوة نبدأ ندوة هذه الليلة مع الأستاذ عماد تيناوي تفضل أستاذ عماد شكرا دكتور محمد السلام عليكم ورمضان كريم إن شاء الله هالشهر هذا يكون خير على على الأجمعين. Uh, I'm gonna switch now to English so we can uh, turn into and I start start sharing my uh, pre, uh, remarks. So um, the, the, the topic today is artificial intelligence development and archaeology. And what we're going to, as Dr. Muhammad just mentioned, we're going to give you a quick overview of the linkage between uh, sustainable development, specifically artificial intelligence and the field of archaeology, to show you some really exciting uh, advances that are happening, that are driving our understanding of archaeology, history, and sustainable development in a new way. Um, what I'm going to cover is, I'll give you a quick overview of who we are as an engaged AI. Then we're going to talk a little bit about what is sustainable development and archaeology. How, uh, what is AI and machine learning? This is going to be a super high level uh, notion of what uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning are all about. Then we're going to give a few examples, pertinent examples that we'll talk about. Uh, AI, um, advances in AI science and business and government, and then why archaeology is ready for artificial intelligence and machine learning. After I finish delivering my remark, uh, Dave will talk, as Dr. Muhammad mentioned, Dave will talk about data, the uses of data, and how data is now, um, uh, the importance of data uh, moving forward. And uh, the third presenter, Samia, uh, and again, Samia Drapo. Uh, we'll talk about how artificial intelligence is being used in a specific case of archaeology of deciphering um, epigraph uh, and trying to interpret them. So um, you, you're going to hear from the data scientists who are the smart people in the room, and you will hear also from me who are focusing on uh, sustainable development. So why don't we start with first what is Engage AI? 
Again, Engage AI uh, is a new organization founded about a year and a half ago that focuses on um, international development or sustainable development and machine learning. We are a non-for-profit organization. We're independent. We do not affiliate with anybody. And the purpose is to collaborate with organizations, academic institutions, other NGOs, uh, and businesses to try to see how do we harness the potential of machine learning to advance human development? How do we address specific challenges for human development? Uh, as all of you know, for example, um, not only in terms of the healthcare, uh, in terms of poverty issues, in terms of employment, AI plays a role in everything else in all of these fields. And the question is how, in what way? So let me start very quickly about sustainable development. And I, I, this is the, the topic that I am most familiar with, um, which is we as a humanity, we are trying, the, the entire world collectively is trying to figure out how do we live today in a way that meets meet our needs, uh, but not at the expense of the next generation. That is, how do we develop the land? How do we use the resources? How do we uh, build? How do we expand in, 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 in where we live in a way that does not impinge on a future generation? How do we utilize uh, water resources, for example, is a great example. How do we utilize water resources in a way that the future generations have also water resources. Um, and the, the entire world in 2015 came together uh, at the UN and they agreed on 17 sustainable development goals. I put it out there because the logo is very distinct and people have been uh, seen it. Some of you have seen it before, which is 17 areas where we are talking about sustainable development in terms of uh, no, no, poverty, zero hunger, health, um, and, uh, health and well-being, education, the environment, um, a variety of targets that look at sustainable development. So that's sustainable, and that's really essentially the focus of, of, of Engage AI is looking at these sustainable development and asking, okay, how do we use artificial intelligence and machine learning to try to achieve these uh, sustainable goals? How do we drive what is known as the 2030 agenda, global agenda forward? Now, if we think, if you look at archaeology, archaeology is involved in the study of sustainable development. Archaeology is, is essentially about the study of humanity and our uh, planet how people interact with each other. What archeologists do with their excavations is they're trying, always trying to ask questions. How did, who lived here? What did they do? How did they interact? How did they interact among each other? How did they interact with their environment? What are the links between this community and other communities? How did their behavior impact the environment and how did the environment impact uh, th these communities? Now, this is important. The study of history is important. The study of archaeology is important because they are important lessons for us in terms of sustainable development. Sustainable development is not going to happen just overnight, and people are not going to understand. And there are really important lessons that we need to figure out about uh, sustainable development and, and use it forward. So why archaeology now, if you think about archaeology and artificial intelligence? If you think about archaeology, again, as a form of study of sustainable development. We want to use artificial intelligence to say, are there new ways we can look at archaeology that will give us, uh, 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 through the lens of artificial intelligence and machine learning, that gives us insight into what's happening, that gives us insight into the way communities left that we have not been able to use before. So artificial intelligence has the potential of deepening our understanding of what happened historically, give us some new clues about the people, about the environment in a way that helps us now plan for the future. Now, uh, again, very, very quickly, what is uh, artificial intelligence? Again, this is a, a topic uh, uh, that everybody is talking about. There are so many definitions out there in terms of what artificial intelligence, but essentially what we are trying to do is 
as uh, Professor uh, uh, McCarthy of Stanford, John McCarthy of Stanford said, said, basically it's the science and engineering of making intelligent machines. All we're trying to do is say, can we get the machines to mimic human intelligence in a variety of tasks? Uh, can they recognize objects? Can they understand text? Can they make decisions? Can they even outperform and issue orders? And what's this may seem obvious, but it turned out that what is a very, very simple task for a human, for example, recognizing an animal as a cat is not such a simple task for a computer. It took some doing for the computer. It took some doing for computer scientists to figure out a way for the computer to start recognizing something is a cat as opposed to a uh, an elephant, right? So we have uh, th the very simple um, notion of uh, that we can, we as humans, our brains as humans, even as children, we can recognize things very quickly. We can not only understand visual things, we can understand text, we can make decisions. Those things are embedded in us. And what we are trying to do with artificial intelligence is say, can we get the machines to mimic humans, uh, to mimic intelligence? Now, there are two big uh, um, fields, if you will. There's general AI, which people talk about, where you have uh, the ability to fully mimic and replicate the human mind, uh, not only in terms of decision making, in terms of recognition, but also perhaps in terms of emotions. We are a little bit far from that, and that's not the focus of our discussion. The focus of our discussion is really what is referred to as narrow artificial intelligence or machine learning, which is a subset of artificial intelligence. Everything you see around you in terms of what is thought of as artificial intelligence is most likely to be around machine learning from, uh, again, Siri, when you give Siri or Alexa an order, all the way to interpreting uh, videos and x-rays to self-driving machines. These are all examples of machine learning. This is what we are focusing on. This is this narrow AI and machine learning is what we're talking about. We're not talking about some robots trying to study archaeology. We're talking about very sophisticated computer programs that allow us to look at archaeology. So, and why now? Now, because in the last five, 10 years, there have been enormous advances in artificial intelligence, in science, in politics and governance and businesses. Most of us are aware of the applications of artificial intelligence in, in businesses. Uh, and most of us hear about it through uh, social networks. We know that it's being operated by artificial intelligence. We know that Uber, for example, and the way they run their drivers, there's a big powerful machine in the background that runs this artificial intelligence. So this, the, we see the application of artificial intelligence on a daily basis for us. I wanna focus on just a couple of examples that really drive a couple of uh, points home. The first one is in science, and, and, I'm, and I'm specifically focusing on medicine because Medicine involves a, a lot of data. And the challenge for medicine has been, how do you take enormous amounts of clinical, medical literature and population and utilization data to inform doctor's decision? I think all of us have been in, in, in the, sometimes the frustrating experience where you, you went to a doctor and he said, well, I'm only specialized in this area. So but what about the other areas? This is now the challenge for medicine. How do we take uh, information from a variety of subfield, synthesize it in a way, integrate it in a way that gives us, gives the doctor better tools to address various um, uh, challenges, various medical issues uh, uh, confronting them. And right now, I just want to give again a very quick example of uh, medical imaging. Right now, AI systems can automate part of the process of medical imaging and analysis. Again, from hours to days, and perhaps in second. Here in uh, Massachusetts, uh, Mass General Hospital, which is one of the oldest hospitals in the world, has actually been deploying uh, AI, has been experimenting on AI 
um, and, uh, um, to diagnose and to integrate it as part of their clinical uh, program and processes. So that's one example. The other example is in epid epidemiology. Uh, some of you may have heard of about this company called the Blue Dot. It's a Canadian company founded by an epidemiologist. They were able to actually detect COVID before anybody else, before the US government. A small Canadian company was able to look at their run algorithms and they were able back in December of 2019, at the end of 2019, say, hey, something is a problem here. There's an, an outbreak of an epidemic. And they were able to do so by gathering enormous amounts of information. They have certain specific things that the epidemiologists have developed. They developed specific algorithms, which are these sophisticated computer programs to predict the outbreak of COVID. The same company, by the way, in 2016, predicted the spread of Zika virus to Florida, again, six months before the government, just by looking at data from the internet, data from other publicly available sources and incorporating it. I'm just gonna move very quickly in terms of, again, examples. Uh, I'm, all of us are familiar with not only the, the searches, not only um, the, you've seen the stuff on the self-driving cars, the logistics. Again, but I wanna go back to one specific example in business that I find really fascinating, which is, uh, something that has been done by Professor y Yutaka Matsuo of the University of T Tokyo. He created an algorithm, again, a sophisticated computer program that was able to detect the sign of earthquake just by monitoring Twitter. Just by monitoring Twitter, he was able to figure that out that if he monitored Twitter account and what's happening out there, he'll be able to, it was just running an experiment. And what he discovered is, he was 90% accurate, 96% actually accurate compared to the Japan Meteorological Agency, just by looking at information and data coming from the internet. So he used a similar technique. He used said, well, if you use it for earthquake and if I am 96%, why not use it in the business context? So he started using the same algorithms, web mining techniques, to the stock market. And he started looking at news article feeding the stock market and supplementing it with news article that gives you an indication whether a company is either having positive or negative performance and therefore able to predict the growth and the profit of a company. These are again, specific example that tells you what, that you can take data from an entirely different areas and apply it to a different subfield. So back to archaeology. So we have advances in, in, in artificial intelligence. I'm going a little bit long, so I'm going to expedite a little bit. We have advances in artificial intelligence. The question is, why archaeology? Well, most people think of archaeology as a number of people going around and just uh, finding, exca excavating, and discovering artifacts in the ground. But the field of ar archaeology actually is one of the most diverse, one of the most uh, multifaceted disciplines around. It involves not just excavation, it involves a whole variety of subfield from environmental archaeology to landscape archaeology to digital archaeology to epigraphy. And each of these fields gather enormous amounts of data. So when we talk about environmental archaeology, for example, and anthropology with the study of fossils, charcoals, or uh, you know, some of the other one, which is taxonomy or genetic analysis, every subfield is generating enormous amounts of data. So much so that he, humans cannot really come up with a way of pulling it all together on their own. So what is it that we're doing? Why AI? Why artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is able to take this massive amount of data from th these different uh, disciplines and sub-disciplines, right? And we keep, keep collecting them. We keep collecting more and more data. Every day there is a new uh, field that's coming up that's adding more data. And we are able to take this data that is usually siloed, this subfield. And the question is, can we integrate them? And that's where AI comes in. 
By combining big data from dis different disciplines, we have the possibility of generating new understanding into archaeology. You take all these separate fields, and again, uh, Samia will give an example of how we're pulling it all together and try to say, does that give us a deeper understanding of what it is? Essentially, what archaeology, uh, 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 why archaeology is ready for AI is because, again, you have these subfields, multiplying amounts of data, and we also have enormous new technologies that are generating more data, not just uh, the, the, the geospatial data, not just genetic data, not just chemistry. In every field, there are new sources of data that we are able to access it. It's reliable data. Then we are incorporating all of it, right? And we're running it through these sophisticated algorithm, which right now, as Dave would tell you, they're open source algorithms that are operating some of the most sophisticated problems that are out there. And archaeology is one area where you can take all of that and start running it through these algorithms to see what we learn from it. Again, we are at the beginning steps, at the infancy of the process. Samia is going to give you an example of how archaeology, uh, how artificial intelligence can be used to decipher um, in looking at epigraphy, looking at text, how do we do the, uh, look at a, a piece of an artifact and say, okay, here is, uh, here is what it means, here is how we compare it, here is the, 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 the uh, full information about the artica, artica, uh, artifact, uh, excuse me. So this is a, a quick sense of where archaeology is, where archaeology is and artificial intelligence. I'm going to quickly turn it over to Dave, who's going to be talking to us about data, the uses of data, and then we're going to circle back to um, Samia to give us an example of how uh, specifically AI is being used in archaeology. Dave. Thank you, Ahmad. Uh, as Ahmad pointed out, the amount of data that's being collected is growing exponentially every month, every year, and it has been for quite some time. We're drowning in the amount of data, and it's difficult to find actually or create knowledge from that data. And as this slide points out, um, not as pretty as the other slides, but data is thought to be the new oil. The ability to have so much information out there and to drill down into this information is providing opportunities for large corporations and individual entrepreneurs. Whether it's looking at the financial world and as Ahmad uh, gave a brief overview, mining every mention of every publicly traded company and determining whether it's being spoken about positive or negatively and figuring out roughly how many people read those articles and what the impact is for trading stocks on a daily basis or whether it's looking at medical information and being able to find patterns in the data. Machine learning is all about patterns and correlations. And that means being able to take data from sources that everybody has known about for a long time and all of this new information, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or anything else available on the internet or privately available information and using machine learning to find patterns or correlations in that information, not just to show what happened in the past, but to be predictive. And that's some of the things that Samia will talk about is, you know, unlike a lot of things in life where they talk about past performance not being indicative of future results, based on the data you have in machine learning, more and more often people are finding they can be predictive. They can be proactive about what it is they're the decisions they're coming to. And that covers everything from self-driving cars that have to interpret every type of example of people that they're driving or other cars on the road and even how to park the car to how the stock market works to coming up with a vaccine for COVID, being able to analyze that information far faster than anybody else. But to me, what's most exciting about data is a lot of this data is available to everyone. Everybody on this call has, if you have access to the internet, you have the ability to drill for new information. 
you have an opportunity to find patterns and information that nobody has found before. And as a result, you have opportunities in front of you or at your disposal that can be magnificent, that can be groundbreaking and earth changing. So, uh, and again, I'm happy to talk to anybody who has questions or comments about this specifically or ideas or share some of the specific projects that I've worked on. But this is very exciting. And, you know, from my standpoint, the fact that everybody, you know, on this call has the ability to become an entrepreneur just based on what they see or do on a daily basis, just by applying new ideas and allowing basic and freely available machine learning algorithms to test their theories, the sky's the limit. So that's, that's my, my introduction to data as the new oil. So very much. And now, yes. Yes. Thank you very much, Imad and, and Dave. Let me just share this. Whoop, sorry. Um, Salamu alaikum. Um, as Rimat said, uh, artificial intelligence is present in our everyday life and is revolutionizing key fields like medicine, science, politics, and even how we do businesses. Tonight, I would like to take you on a journey to discover how AI can help bring history and archeology span research to their next level. Imagine you are in El Jauf and you stumble upon this magnificent rock inscription. As an epigraphist, your brain starts right away by observing the whole piece. Is it damaged? How many hands have drawn? We have inscription belonging to the same period. You let the information flow freely to your expert brain so that it can better prepare the next steps allowing the analysis, the following steps of the analysis. Then you draw the piece on your field notebook, text and symbol alike. You even take pictures now that we have cameras. Follow discussion, follows, sorry, follows discussion with your colleague for a first deciphering on the spot. Do we recognize names or, or tribes? And that's where the difficult part begins. Where do sentences begin and end? How do we separate words? These two symbols, are they the same letter or are they different? And that's gonna change the meaning of the word that we're reading and maybe the meaning of the whole sentence. Oh, and, and, and look here, the, the damage area. Can we recognize the, the, the letters under it and, and, and have the end of the sentence? The list of questions goes on and on, but those four are the major pain points when sample, stumbling upon such an art rock. Artificial intelligence, such as segmentation, sentence segmentation, that's the, the, the mechanics, the algorithm, the program that allow to separate letters and, and, and words and, and, and encryption in everywhere in, se, in individual sentences, but also word segmentation, but it's not, it's not just having a collection of, of letters. Remember, remember when you have the puzzle where you have all the letters of a text and then you need to put the commas and the dots and everything. That's word segmentation, a program that will allow to separate the groups of letters that come together as a word and then the sentence. There is also character recognition and suggestion for partial characters. And that can help with, for example, those two letters that we, symbols that we think are the same, but maybe there is some like differences that the computer has learned to, 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 to detect and help us uh, decipher and, and different the two. So those, those techniques will help tremendously epigraphists and archeologists answering the, the, the four 
uh, pain points that I, the four questions uh, that we had before. But keep in mind that artificial intelligence will never replace the expertise of a seasoned art epigraphist. It is not here to replace your work. However, it can help them with this time consuming task and becoming another tool in their toolbox next to their notebook and camera. Freed of this, of this task, they can spend their time and energy leveraging their expertise, their true expertise. That is contextualizing the finding. That means putting this inscription, this word into a broader system, a broader, broader yeah, context. For example, why this specific place for the inscription? I mean, there is the whole mountain, the whole, why here? Is there something special about this place? Is there water close by? Or maybe it is on a trade route, or maybe there is a camp nearby, or it's a hunting area, probably. And oh, we should check with the archaeologists. Maybe there is archaeological remains in the surrounding that will explain why there is this interruption. The answer of this question is what helps us understand the life and the stories of our ancestors, the challenges their community faced, and the solution they imagined. With the current development of artificial intelligence, two main fields can contribute to bringing archaeology to, their, to its next level. Natural language processing and computer vision and pattern recognition. In the next two slides, I will give you a short introduction, just a glimpse to this field, because like each topic will take a full hour to, to just uh, scratch, but I just want to give you a short introduction of what the field are and the possible potential contribution to archaeology and history research. It's a, a, a field between, uh, um, uh, sorry, an interdisciplinary branch of study between computer science and linguistic. The words, the sentences, the language, and the computer that focuses on giving the computers the ability to read, write, listen, and understand the language used by us. By us now, but it can also be used to understand the language used by our ancestors. In fact, you already use NLP, so natural language processing, in your everyday life. For example, anytime you type while composing a message or like search a query, NLP helps you type faster by auto-completing your word or even suggesting the next word in your sentence. What I'm showing here is just example of techniques used for solving problems using NLP. You can recognize one that I mentioned earlier, sentence segmentation. That was a technique to separate group of, of letters and words into individual sentence. There is another one interesting for our problem at hand. It is the name entity recognition, the last before, the one before last. Carefully craft an artificial intelligent algorithm, so a program could automatically recognize the names of people and tribe written in the inscription, inscription sorry, using this technique. Hence, allowing us to instantaneously click link this inscription to others containing the same names and hence broader our perspective on the artifact. That was for natural language processing. The other subject I told you about was the field was computer vision and pattern recognition. Computer vision, it's actually two fields combining together to have a, a, a techniques that can be powerful to archaeology. Computer vision is the field of computer science that works on enabling computers to see, identify and process images 
in the same way that human vision does. Basically, it's giving the computer the ability to see like we do. Here you have an example of a computer segmenting like, oh, here is person, here is a dog, here is a light. Like the same here, like earlier this afternoon, my son came to see this picture and said, oh, there is um, cars and there is a cute dog. That's what we're trying to give to the computer without the cuteness of, of, of a son. But pattern recognition, on the other hand, is the process of recognizing regularities in data by a machine that uses artificial algorithm, uh, artificial intelligence algorithm, sorry. Archaeology actually already had successfully applied these techniques. I stumbled upon a paper um, that was out last summer, if I'm not mistaken. And that's an example of this paper. In this paper, they used, so it's in the Sholestan Desert in Pakistan, and they use computer vision and pattern recognition to automatically detect archaeological mounts using multi-sensor and multi-temporal satellite data. This approach allowed the detection of hundreds of new sites deeper in the desert that they previously suspected, including some several large size urban center. And by large, we mean, they mean um, 30 hectares, like cities, basically. These findings bring a new understanding for the, for the, for the, the team that, that did this research regarding the influence of climate change because they were surprised to find artifacts or like sites so deep into the desert. So there was an influence of climate change on, on, on those cities and the desertification in the, the collapse of the large um, old world civilization. The same an artificial intelligence the features so the, the path of thousands of kilometers of old river throughout modern Pakistan. And the data out of this model now assists the government in discovering smart ways to use water resources. And here, it's an example of the full loop back. Archaeology knowledge of how the water used to flow is helping nowadays communities to be smarter in how they can collect and, and, and utilize the water resources. This short introduction was really just a glimpse into the possibilities of how um, AI can change history and archaeology and how the research are done. I will conclude my presentation with, again, this magnificent art rock you found at the start of our journey. Today's biggest challenge in archaeology is not to make new discoveries, but it's to work through the ever increasing body of already of the data that we have in multiple transverse fields. We don't have just an inscription here. We have an inscription and we have the, 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 the um, um, sorry, the, um, the surroundings, the climate at, at, the, at the time that it was there, and, and the story also, the, the, the tribes and the dynamics all explain why it was written here, the trades routes and everything. And the problem, as Saimad said, that trying to draw conclusions for so much data, from so much data, experts have no choice to look at a narrow subset. And AI is here as a tool to allow expanding this, this expert abilities to see broader pattern in the data. In fact, AI is the tool that will allow historians and archeologists to leverage their core expertise and fully use the power of cross-field data to narrate the complete story of our ancestors, the challenge their community faced, and the solution they imagine and that can help us today. Thank you. Shukran Sayyid Imad, Sayyid David, 
دكتورة سامية على هذا الثراء المعرفي والمعلومات التي استفدنا منها بشكل كبير جدا عن فكرة استخدام الذكاء الصناعي في علم الآثار وتطور تاريخ الإنسان نستأذنكم بالبدء باستقبال المداخلات ولدينا المداخلة الأولى من الدكتور جاسر الحربش الرئيس التنفيذي لهيئة التراث تفضل دكتور جاسر السلام عليكم صوت واضح نعم واضح تفضل شكرا لكم للدارة الله يسلمكم على العرض uh, just a quick uh, a quick comment uh, I'm really happy to have uh, this talk tonight Uh, joining all disciplines from different sciences, especially AI. My question, uh, since we do have, we are at the beginning of the Heritage Commission in Saudi Arabia of, of uh, announcing and building up a huge rock art uh, project over, uh, over all the kingdom. And part of this is the documentation and, of course, interpretation and all of the usual processes. What, what is uh, a matter for today's talk is... the process of learning or teaching the algorithms or the machines about the special rock arts in Saudi Arabia. Because I believe, and please correct me, that if we are applying the same concept in Saudi Arabia uh, and this special, in this specific project, then we need a learning process to learn the algorithms itself about the, the rock arts that is already in Saudi Arabia in different areas, and we have thousands of them. And we will be happy, and this is an occasion to, to, to tell everyone here in the, in the talk and the audience, we'll happy to listen from any other, other experience from worldwide to help us to do this project, especially with the technology that's presented today or other technologies. Thank you. Shukran, Dr. Jasser. Um, I'm just going to add a couple, couple of things to what Dr. Jasser, because Dr. Jasser is exactly right. And Samia alluded to it. You know, Saudi Arabia has a rich heritage and rich collection, right? There's an enormous amount of data. So what Dr. Jasser was talking about is like, you get all of that data, you try to run it through the algorithms, but at the end of the day, you need expertise, you need Saudi archaeologists, right? And as a matter of fact, this is one of the key things we want today's presentation to, to, to the takeaway, one of the key takeaways out of this presentation, which is this is archaeology now in Saudi Arabia is a very exciting field because it combines not just, you know, you're uh, doing excavation, but it's actually uh, uh, multiple disciplines, including artificial intelligence and machine learning. Artificial intelligence and machine learning on their own will not address your problem without the human Uh, or what they call the human in the loop, without the humans understanding what's going on there. And therefore, and that's going to come from Saudi archaeologists. That's going to come from Saudi experts who are working in the field of machine learning and archaeology. And if I were a Saudi student right now starting in archaeology, one of the first things I'll try to figure out is how do I also plug in into machine learning and data science, because this is the future. And what's amazing about it is this field, because this field is generating more volumes and volumes and volumes of data. So there is, uh, again, if I were young today as, as a starting student, I would be focusing on archaeology, machine learning, data science, these, how do we combine these things? And, you know, you're looking at it all in the context of Saudi Arabia. I'll leave my colleagues, maybe Dave or Samia can add a couple of other additional words. The, the combination of all of the things people are finding and, and even tourists allows people to become amateur archaeologists by being able to take photos of things that they see that might be interesting. It adds to the collections and through machine learning, the, the lineage of these pieces, the traceability and the Uh, connection of these pieces can be uncovered that the expert archaeologists can then oversee. Those are the humans in the loop and the process can be accelerated, but it, it creates the, you know, we, we've been talking about it as archaeologists for a day kind of thing where anybody has the opportunity to really sort of get into the field, learn about it and understand more about your history.
I can I can just really um, add an emphasis on this point. AI and machine learning is is not magical. It's not a magical one that will do miracles. We need experts. It's really just a tool to enhance the capabilities of the experts. It's yeah, and yeah, just. شكرا. حقيقة بدنا نشكر الدكتور جاسر لأنه فتح المجال للموضوع هذا ونتقدم بالسؤال الآتي: ما هو أفضل طريقة لإطلاق العمل بالذكاء الاصطناعي في مجال الآثار من خلال الأقسام الأكاديمية المتخصصة؟ وما هو المطلوب من جانب الأكاديميين الآثريين؟ I'm going to repeat the question just to make sure that I un understand correctly. It's what we need to like tomorrow have the AI and the tool, the new tools in the in the bag of archaeologists. Is that is that? Uh, uh, my question is: Was what, what is the best way to launch the AI through the academic departments or archaeology academic departments? And what is expected by our Oh, through uh, the archaeologists. The, the best area. way. Yes. Yeah. The best way would be to have um, artificial intelligence experts, Saudi um, artificial intelligence expert, and um, archaeologists expert coming in the same room, and archaeologists saying, "Okay, this is our main problem right now. We want to be able to take a picture." and decipher on the spot what is written, or, or just the, the letters, because what I show you is, is a very nice instruction, but most of the resources we have, like not most, but uh, there is situation where the inscription is so old that is that the time that's just faded and we have hard time to decipher like what's the character. And so for me, that's what heard of both in the same room and the archaeologist saying, this is our main point, main point. How, do, how do we come up with a tool together to, to answer this, this pain point? Did I answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. Any comments, uh, Imad? It's mute. On mute. You're Just very quickly, I think what, what's, what's exciting, look, the, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, uh, you already have the academic institutions, you already have the businesses, the government that is committed to the uh, uh, artificial intelligence and the resources, right? So the question is, how do you ca ca leverage that infrastructure? How do you develop it further, develop the AI infrastructure? How do you start developing the multidisciplinary team? Remember, a lot of what we were talking about is how do we break the silos? So that the academicians are doing work on their own and the uh, machine learning experts are doing that. How do we break that silo? How do we cooperate? So it, what you need is very quickly an interdisciplinary team between archaeologists, machine learning, Saudi experts, right? Sitting together who come together and say, okay, as Sami says, let's identify a specific challenge that we can go from. And it's very likely to start with what's the data we have? How do we collect it? How do we create a data platform that we can clean up, can we can make, make it uh, available and accessible to everybody else? What other resources do we need? What kind of algorithms? They'll work on it to, to, to collectively, right? So it's already, you already have the key ingredients in Saudi Arabia. It's just trying to take them to the next level and bring them together. And again, Dave has worked quite a bit in the financial sector with other companies where this is exactly what they do. They bring in machine learning and data people with the business people and they put them together, try to address specific, starting with a specific challenge. Thank you so much. Uh, let's move to uh, these questions from uh, Dr. Suleiman Shehri. The first question is how we could transfer the human knowledge into AI. So AI, oh. go ahead. Go sorry. ahead, yeah, yeah. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. 
AI, like everything else in life, just like a child, needs to start off with some small basic concepts. And those concepts become the foundation that can then be grown. So once you find a proof of concept of anything that you're looking for in particular, uh, not only can that be expanded to uh, strengthen and increase what you, the capabilities are, people get excited when they see results. And that excitement alone brings the energy for people, more people to get involved and enhance the capabilities. But you have to think of it you know, in, in its easiest sense, like a small child that needs to be taught each of the, whether it's letters or how to recognize shapes. And Ahmad gave an earlier example of being able to recognize a lion versus a cat. All of these things have to be trained into an artificial intelligence or machine learning process, but it is doable. If your expectations are realistic and you have small enough tasks to get started, you'll find that very quickly you can grow and expand what the capabilities are. Good. Uh, the second question is, uh, to how extent uh, the, all, the AI applications have reached neutral network? Neural networks like artificial intelligence are something that sometimes gets confusing what people mean. The earliest sense of neural networks were thought to be learning machines, but the reality is most of what a neural network was was another form of machine learning. But when you combine machine learning systems, you then get some more exponential growth to them. But really at the end of the day, most of what people think of as artificial intelligence or even neural networks to some extent is one form or another of machine learning. And at this stage, there is a human in the loop overseeing how things are working and what the output is and to ensure that it's headed in the right direction. That said, that also creates a bit of bias. So people have to be careful because you don't wanna train the machine to think the way you do you want to make sure that the machine is able to sort of draw inferences that aren't biased by the trainer. Uh, I think Dr. Suleiman is directing uh, Dave with his question. The third question is in data perspective, what we need to prepare and re-engineering data to more applicable for using AI and ML and deep learning? Huh. So so in data, there's something called metadata. And what metadata is, is it's data about your data. So one of the first things that can be done is start to classify the information that's being fed into the systems. So for example, as Samia was talking about using photographs and everything else, you know, the beauty of cameras today is they can catalog the day and time automatically of a photograph. A lot of them can even capture the global positioning system information, where exactly it was taken. And you know the time of day. So you're getting a lot of data about the photograph, but by being able to add additional information to it, it allows the systems to much more easily understand pieces of different things that come together without the machine necessarily having to decipher. So the ability to classify or categorize or create a standard set of language surrounding the various artifacts from all uh, that are being taken would help for sure. Thank you, Dave. Uh, let's move to Dr. Saad Al Arifi. Father Dr. Saad. Marhaba. Ahlan, Dr. Father. سعيد جدا بالمشاركة في هذا الندوة وسماع هذه الأوراق الجميلة جدا حول الذكاء الاصطناعي وعندي سؤالين أو استفسارين مهمة جدا أحاول منذ فترة أن أتعرف عليها ولكن لم أجد إجابة شافية الاستفسار الأول كيف لعلم الذكاء الاصطناعي أن يساهم في اكتشاف الآثار المطمورة في المدن العملاقة أقصد المبنية الحية الرياض مثلا الاستفسار الثاني في منطقة مقاربة للتاريخ أقصد الأرشيف كيف للذكاء الاصطناعي أن يساعد في فرز الوثائق وترتيب المتشابه منها تمييز الكلمات فيها 
ملاحظة السياقات الزمنية في الوثائق وربط بعضها ببعض شكرا شكرا دكتور سعد I can maybe uh, take a take a uh, try answering uh, those two questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Saad, for, for those questions. Uh, the first one was about how we can discover new archaeological, um, um, not artifact, but uh, sites under cities, urban cities. Um, everything depends on the data you have. But if you have, uh, so first we, we will need to use uh, sensors that can map the underground without destroying what is uh, above. Um, and if you have this data and you, you want to learn, you want to first teach the algorithm to recognize that, okay, this type of, of, of um, signal is uh, a wall a wall made of, of stones that are different than, than the, the soil that you have next to it. So it's gonna, if you, if you, don't, need, if you don't have the data at the beginning, you, you're gonna have to, to put up a lot of work to gather the data and, and, and tag it saying like, okay, this is a wall, this is um, a fire uh, place, this is, uh, but once you have that, then, and once you have the model that is performing correctly, you, you, the expert said, okay, the, the model managed to get the sense of what we're looking for. Then you can just survey the whole area and it, it will just like say, oh, I think here is, there is a, a, a big probability that here there is remaining of an old house, of a, of a house. Um, so, but the, the key point here is data. Thank you. What you were saying is it's noticing patterns. So Samia exactly. was pointing out that she was training the system to notice different sized stones being placed together that seem different than what, be, what might be natural surrounding it. That's a pattern. So by training those patterns and being able to expose it to larger areas of land, you're more likely to be able to see some of those patterns and discover things that might be under you know, other buildings or under underground. And the second question was archives, the archive and, and how we can uh, leverage. And um, again, here, if you have the data or, or you can even have maybe another archive foundation had done a similar work you're trying to do, but on other text, you can, reuse part of their modeling of what the machine learned uh, that are that is not specific to their collection to your collection and and expedit it um, uh, make it faster to recognize catalog uh, tag all documents and the letters and stuff like that but again it's it's the you ai as as dave said ai is a child if you don't feed them um, um, data they will not learn. But if you have the data, then, then it's like a child. It will learn anything you want. But you, yeah, you need to make, a t uh, make sure that it's not learning what you want to see, but really what is the, in the data, like having an objective uh, opinion. Thank you, Dr. Samia. I, uh, I hope I answered the questions. Yes, um, yes. Uh, قبل أعتقد أن وقت المحاضرة قد بلغ النهاية قبل أن ننهي المحاضرة فقط إذا كان الدكتور جاسر لديه مداخلة لأني أرى رفع يده دكتور جاسر طيب <تصفيق> شكرا للجميع سيد عماد وسيد ديفيد ودكتور سامي على هذا العرض الممتع والرائع والجديد عن استخدام الذكاء الاصطناعي في علم الآثار وتطور تاريخ الإنسان محاضرتنا القادمة بإذن الله يوم الأربعاء المقبل ستكون عن الأنساب والحمض النووي ويلقيها الأستاذ الدكتور عماد العتيقي
وكما ذكرت لكم أن المجال مفتوح لكم لاستقبال اقتراحاتكم في جميع مجالات تطوير المنتدى على الإيميل الخاص أو على البريد الإلكتروني الخاص بالمنتدى دارة توكس نراكم على خير بإذن الله شكرا لمحاضرينا الكرام على هذه الليلة الممتعة صبحونا على خير والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Thank you very much for having us today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Ma salama. Salam.